You may have the universe, if I may have Italy. Giuseppe Verdi. Apologies for the mispronunciation, but let's move forward. Italy is a nation that needs no introduction. Its contributions to art, cuisine, music, science, technology, industry, civics, engineering, and spirituality are staggering, arguably unmatched. However, it is also a nation mired in lackluster economic performance, corruption, and division. Italy has an unusual place in geopolitics, blurring the lines between a great power and a middle power. This video will assess Italy's current power projections. A nation that is simultaneously viewed as both an economic and cultural powerhouse, but also as a washed up former political power well past its prime. Let's start off with geography. Most people who pass middle school know that Italy is a peninsula that kind of looks like a boot kicking a football. From what it looks like, Sicily is a deflated football, mind you. Anyway. The country has a temperate climate, however, it is far warmer than its North American counterparts due to the Gulf Stream bringing in warm waters from the Gulf of Mexico, hence why Milan has fairly nice weather and my hometown of Toronto is a frozen hellscape during the wintertime. Much of the country has a Mediterranean climate with warm dry summers and is generally considered very suitable for dense human habitation and agriculture. The northern portion of the country is composed of snow-capped mountains bordering France, Switzerland, Austria, and Slovenia. This mountain range acts as a natural barrier, blocking off enemy forces from the north. And while this hasn't been a major concern since World War II, historically it certainly was and may be an important asset barrier in the future. Slightly further south is the Po River Valley, a rich fertile land with numerous tributaries connecting Milan, Parma, and other major cities in what is the wealthiest and most industrious part of the country. Northern Italy has been heavily influenced by Germanic culture and continues to play a disproportionate role in the country's economic and political affairs with cities like Milan and Genoa and to a lesser extent Venice. Venice used to be very geopolitically important, but now it's mostly a glorified museum for tourists. Further south lies Florence, the birthplace of the Renaissance, and even further south lies the central part of the country where the capital Rome resides. Do I really need to describe what Rome is? It's in this half of the country where the bulk of economic innovation and political power come from. One of Italy's defining features and problems is its north-south divide. The north is far wealthier and innovative, while the south is poorer and more agrarian. This makes economic indicators like GDP per capita fairly misleading as they don't take into account this disparity. Northern Italians accuse southern Italians of being lazy, while southern Italians accuse the north of being smug. Kind of reminds me of another country I could name. Northern Italy and the island of Sicily have a far warmer climate, which is excellent for farming grapes, olives, and other crops, even though they lag behind the rest of the country in other affairs. There is one area where the South is the undisputed winner. It's diaspora. Most people of Italian descent in nations like the US, Canada, Brazil, and Argentina migrated from the South and have had a massive influence on the cultures of their receiving nations. Now, I was going to go in depth into the country's history, but then I realized that would probably take a few months to watch, let alone create, and wouldn't be too relevant into the modern geopolitics, so I will start off with its creation as a modern nation-state. While the written records go back to the Bronze Age, the nation of Italy is actually younger than that of the United States. Ever since the Roman Empire collapsed, the peninsula has been broken down into tiny city-states and small territories. Some of these, like Florence, Genoa, Venice, and the Papal States, had their time in the sun. They were far smaller than most other European powers, though. The rise of the printing press and the invasion by Napoleon created a sense of shared Italian identity on the peninsula. And through the leadership of Garibaldi, the Pope, and others, the nation unified through a combination of wars and diplomacy. This created a powerful nation, but also political and economic distress, particularly in the South, which was largely run by the Mafia. This resulted in a mass exodus to the Americas, hence why Italians make up a plurality in cities like New York and the majority in countries like Argentina. Italy waffled on the eve of World War I, looking like it would join the Central Powers with Germany, but ended up deciding to join Britain and France instead to fight the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was allied with Germany. Around this time, many Italians looked back at their history and compared it with the lackluster nation-state that they were currently living in. 
Some saw the empires of Britain and France and wanted some black and brown people to subjugate. You see, the Italian peninsula was once the center of the region, when the Mediterranean was the known world. But with the rise of transoceanic trade, this was no longer the case. Italy became less relevant on the world stage as it really didn't have any oceanic borders, just the Mediterranean. As it saw Britain and France, and even the US and Japan, take over from its power rankings. Italy's geography has rendered it a has-been power. Benito Mussolini, the quasi-founder of fascism, would later take control over the government, suppressing civil liberties, the press, speech, elections, and promoting extreme nationalism, militarism, and later support for the Nazis, despite his unease with Hitler's racial pseudoscience, which deemed Italians as not quite Aryan enough. Mussolini wanted to create a new Roman Empire. The country's empire was tiny, with small colonies in Libya and to a lesser extent the Balkans, so he decided to invade what is now Ethiopia, the last major African power not to be colonized by Europeans. And the Italians lost. It was humiliating, and Italy's performance in World War II would be even more embarrassing, frequently requiring the Germans to save their asses. Italy was eventually defeated by American and Canadian troops, and democracy was installed. Mussolini was then hung upside down with his mistress by piano wire as various old ladies took turns stabbing their dead corpses. Dead corpses is redundant, isn't it? Please don't demonetize me, Susan Wojcicki. I know you're going to anyway. Anyway, at this point, Italy became a vassal state in the United States. It received American aid from the Marshall Plan, formed a democracy, and a social safety net, along with strong trade relations with its neighbors. It also joined the US-led military alliance of NATO, along with other European powers, preventing future conflicts in the region and acting as a bulwark against the Soviets. The dominant party were the Christian Democrats, while the Communist Party still gained traction in the background. The Vatican and the CIA cooperated during this time to make sure the Communists didn't gain too much traction. Italy eventually rebuilt itself in the 1960s, and the northern part of the country regained a powerful industrial base while the South lagged behind. In 2008 and 2009, the country was hit hard by the Great Recession and was part of the unflattering acronym the PIGS countries in relation to those supposedly lazy Southern Europeans, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, i.e. PIGS. And with that, let's move on to their economy. Italy has the fourth largest economy on the continent, after Germany, France, and Britain. These nations are known unoriginally as the Big Four, and Italy is the least big of the Big Four, with a reputation that blurs the lines between middle and great power. The North is a major industrial hub focusing on metallurgy, pharmaceuticals, and machinery. This is also the region where much of the luxury goods are produced. By taking in raw materials from other countries, namely developing countries, and then producing them into manufactured goods and then strapping on a Gucci or Prada label, they can make huge profits over materials that cost a fraction of the price. Italian brands have a reputation for high quality and craftsmanship, even though it's mired in excessive consumerism and vapid status projection. Perhaps no other country aside from France benefits from these intangible assets like brand recognition than Italy does. This brand image is expanded to the nation as a whole as the country is one of the top five nations for tourists, bringing in massive sums of money, making sure that those priceless paintings, sculptures, and buildings that were built during the classical and renaissance period have produced revenue far beyond what people centuries and millennia prior to could have ever dreamed of. The South, on the other hand, still largely remains agrarian, with major crops being wheat, tomatoes, grapes, olives, oranges, almonds, and others suited to a Mediterranean climate. Italy's culinary footprint is arguably unmatched, due in part to its large diaspora from the South. However, not all is sunshine and rainbows. Unlike other great powers like the US and Japan, Italy lacks a major high-tech hub, and its economy stifles more innovation than it produces. The Italian economy is fairly anti-competitive and filled with oligopolies, that is, industries where a small handful of firms run the show and stifle competition, sometimes even merging into monopolies and cartels. Ever wonder why glasses are so overpriced? 
Well, this is because nearly all lens crafters, sunglass makers, and glasses retailers are run by an Italian company, Luxottica. Ray-Bans, sunglasses which are an iconic part of Americana, are actually owned by Luxottica. Aside from being anti-competitive, the Italian economy is also ripe with corruption and nepotism, as are its politics. The country holds a poor track record of fiscal irresponsibility and oftentimes runs on large deficits, accruing large sums of debt in relation to its GDP. In the past, Italy would solve these problems through monetary policy, oftentimes by printing more money. This was no longer the case once Italy joined the Eurozone, oftentimes infuriating the Germans and other Northern Europeans with this reckless government spending. However, for all of Italy's problems, they never fell into the same shitstorm of Greece and Italy's reputation as an economic basket case, while having some element of truth, is fairly exaggerated. Moving on to the institution that manages this economy, Italy is a democratic republic, which has maintained the same constitution since 1948 and the few years after World War II. The government is divided into legislative, executive, and judicial branch. Fairly uncommon. While far better functioning than that of the developing world, the Italian government is notorious in Europe for its corruption and nepotism. And while the state of affairs has improved since the days of the Mafia stranglehold on Sicilian and southern Italian local governments, the bribes, cheating, and incompetence still take their toll. Italy's government and economy also faces another set of challenges, namely demography. The country is one of the oldest populations in the world. Thankfully, due to the welfare state and the common use of multi-generational households, most of the elderly are well taken care of. However, this will put a major strain on the economy in future decades, similar to what is currently going on in Japan, whereby a small population of working age adults will have to support a large population of old people who are not contributing to the production of goods and services. Unlike Japan, Italy has not yet had widespread automation to take care of its elderly. And unlike much of the Anglosphere, they don't bring in large numbers of young immigrants. This will most likely lead to a con contraction, unless major technological breakthroughs or large-scale immigration ensues. Moving on to their military and foreign affairs. The Italian military is fairly respectable despite its historical lackluster performance. By joining NATO in the aftermath of World War II, Italy placed itself into the American sphere of influence. The US even holds an American air base in the north that may or may not host nuclear weapons, we don't know for sure. This pretty much ensures that Italy is under the protection of the United States and NATO powers. This makes chances of engaging in military conflicts with its neighbors very unlikely. Bordering countries like France and Croatia are part of NATO, and Switzerland and Austria are neutral. In response to this American protection, Italy has engaged in numerous US-led military engagements like in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as several peacekeeping missions. Thankfully, Europe has endured a long peace, so far. Its economic integration through the EU and its military integration through NATO makes war between neighbors very unlikely. Now, some countries like Switzerland are not part of NATO or the EU, but let's keep it real. An invasion by the Swiss just isn't gonna happen. While much of Eastern Europe fears Russia, Italy is at a safe distance, which places it in a fairly secure location. Now, it looks very good for now, but if this order crumbles, then it's gonna look a lot uglier for Italy. Italy maintains a rocky relationship with its former colony Libya, and mass illegal migration continues to be a concern. Italy also has close ties to many nations in the Americas that have large Italian diasporas, such as Canada, the United States, Brazil, and especially Argentina. The diaspora has played a major role in projecting Italian soft power, and I'm sure that nearly every person watching this is familiar with Italian culture on some level or at the very least, a bastardization of it. Overall, Italy has a massive amount of cultural soft power and will continue to have a large footprint on the world in that regard. But its supposed status as a great power is likely to decline to that of a middle power, as nations like Brazil and India take over its place, as well as economic powerhouses of Western immigrant nations like Canada and Australia, which will all probably surpass its power projections in the coming decades. 
This is especially the case with Italy's demographic stagnation and economic mismanagement. But I'm still optimistic about Italy. From the Romans to the Renaissance to Venice's trade networks, this peninsula keeps coming back into the spotlight, and I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again. Thanks for watching. Bye.